Hello? Still discussing Jesus comparing himself to a serpent on a pole from Numbers 21. And we're discussing the snake being a type of corruption and how that relates to Jesus hanging his flesh on a, on a cross uh, for us, our salvation. And I was discussing Jesus standing in the middle of heaven and earth uh, laying down his life for the brethren, uh, for those that look to him and trust that giving up your advantage in this life for equality is, is spiritual life and the true path to heaven. And the aspect of having to give up your personal advantage or your greed or your wealth in this life well, let's just look at it. Where'd you go? Matthew six, nineteen. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If, thine eye be, if, if your eye is clear, then the whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be corrupt, evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, if you have darkness in you and you think it's light, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet your body or what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? So, this aspect of, of wealth is what's going to interfere with your relationship with God. You can't serve money And the Lord. And the Jewish ritual was subverted by greed. They didn't want to offer their bulls and goats. They're bringing little sickly animals because they want to hang on to their profit. They want, to, they want the best for themselves. And just like on the altar, the fat belonged to the Lord. They considered the fat the best part of the meat. Uh, so this aspect of the Lord taking your advantage and your gain and your wealth away from you, your idea of wealth, cause, because when you don't lust or, or try to dominate or take hold of your wealth, then you're the wealthiest person around. When you give up your wealth, you're the wealthiest person around. And that was what the Jews wanted in, in Numbers 11 and 5 and in Numbers 21 where we're discussing. They wanted the cucumbers and the leeks and the fish and all of the abundance of commodities that made them think their desires were full. I mean, compared to what they were doing in the wilderness. So this aspect of of wealth won't 
in personal gain won't leave. And Jesus was so extreme in the way that he, he came at this. He said in Luke 22, verse 42, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, referring to his crucifixion. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So Jesus took it beyond the extreme of wealth to the, your only arguable piece of property, your body, uh, in the suffering of your body. He gave up the comfort of the flesh completely. Like, to, like take that. The last thing I got, take it away from me. If it's the will of the Lord. So that's how you hang your flesh on the pole, on the cross. That's how you get the serpent on the pole, by denying yourself and contradicting yourself for the will of God. Which the first commandment was, partake of all the trees of the garden except one. Be equal under God. This is my house. Every child can understand that because every child grows up in their father's house sharing the resources equally as long as they obey the rules. So that was the first commandment. Share the resources equally. But Eve lifted herself up above the commandment of God to take from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She's going to decide her own values. She's going to and trust a different value to the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, the name of the tree is citing the problem. So when Eve lifted herself up to gain advantage, she lost all advantage. And they were kicked out from the tree of life. They lost life forever. They lost fellowship with God. They lost equality of men. And we're not going back unless we go back together. Because going back is embracing equality. It's the very nature of heaven on earth. When men stop take, lifting themselves up, taking control of resources, taking control of the souls of men, having advantage over each other, once mankind gives up their advantage, then we'll see some peace. John twelve twenty five. See some more of these. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also shall my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor." So you got to lose your life to find it. Go ahead and read John 10, 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. And this is the commandment I have received of my Father. So... So Jesus had the power to not be crucified is what he's saying. And he gave, he gave up on that. He didn't, he didn't use his power. He hung his power up on the cross.
John 17. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. So, Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself. He's referring to his crucifixion on the cross. And how he sanctifies himself is through the truth. <laughs> if you back up to verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So Jesus uses the word to sanctify himself. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he, he used the word to sanctify himself. You can see this in action. This gets interesting. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted for forty days and forty nights, he afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus, the Son of God, who can raise the dead, walk on water, cause the blind, deaf, dumb to be healed, cause the insane to miraculously be sane can make stones into bread. He can use the power of God within him for himself because he's hungry. Just like the Jews in the wilderness, they were hungry and they loved the light bread. Essentially, to make stones into bread would have been to loathe himself as the Son of God. How about that? And Jesus sanctified himself of the devil, of the temptation, with the truth, with the word of God. And Jesus quotes scripture, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. Diabolos means to cast down. So cast yourself down. Uh, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. So same thing, he, Jesus is being tempted to uh, cast down God within Him. Uh, to tempt God uh, to do a miracle which the Jews were continually tempting God to do a miracle. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Jesus was quoting scripture again. I'm not telling y'all where he's quoting these. Deuteronomy 6.16 Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All of these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then all of the Jews expected the Messiah of Israel to conquer the world. Uh, so Jesus would have had a following had he decided to conquer the world, he would add a lot of support. <clears throat> and Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only will thou serve. I'm not going to worship 
my idea of God within me. I'm not going to worship my authority on earth. I'm not going to worship my advantage in this life. Uh, then the devil leaves with him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Resist the devil, and he will flee. I've never heard anybody mention the similarities between Jesus' temptation and Balaam and his encounter with Balak, the king of Moab. Uh, the king of Moab takes him up to three high places and tempts him to curse Israel. Jesus would have been cursing Israel to have given in to temptation and sin. Uh, it would have destroyed his atonement, which would have been the redemption of Israel, which would have been cursing Israel. <laughs> so. But let's look at it. There's so much in this story of Balaam uh, concerning this. I mean, like we're talking about Numbers chapter 21. And Balaam and his story starts in chapter 22. So direct relationship to the context. Balak, the son of Zippor, saw, saw all that the people of Israel had done to the Amorites, and Balak was the king of Moab. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. There's two million of them. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at this time, and he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, and curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake to him the words of Balak. So they brought him the money, the bribe to curse Israel. Uh, they they kind of showed this in 300, a movie called 300, um, where he had to climb the mountain and bring the nasty old guys the, the gold and see an oracle before he could go to war. Now, nah, it's a real similar situation to that going on right here. But... So they came to Balaam and told him what Balak wanted, and they want him to come back. Uh, to go curse, curse Israel. And Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me then, preadventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse this people, for they are blessed. Uh, so that's what Balaam told him. And uh, they, they returned and told Balak, you know, Balaam refuses to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. So he sends a better entourage. Hey, maybe I need to impress this guy. Uh, 
And they asked him to curse the people. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, If you would give me the house, if you would give me his house full of silver and gold, like give me the throne with all of his money, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to say or do less or more. Now therefore I pray you tarry here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me. And God came unto Balaam again and said unto him, If the, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princess of Moab. So that's where Balaam messed up. God said, if they call to thee. He didn't, he didn't wait for the men to come to call. Balaam just was like, oh, cool, I can go. Time to ride out, get this money. Which we'll see that that was indeed the case. But so the angel of the Lord is appearing to his donkey that he's riding on, and the donkey's freaking out and trying not to go, and he's beating his donkey. And then the donkey's the donkey's like, "Oh, why are you beating me? You know, the angel of the Lord with his fiery sword's about to kill us both." <laughs> and then uh, God opens Balaam's eyes. Uh, so that's how serious, I'm mentioning this to show how serious him disobeying the Lord was. In 22 verse 41, it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam, after they hook up, and, and brought him up into the high place of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. So, so there you have him go into the high place, and and Balaam says to Balak, build me seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen. And I'm sure that his seven altars were probably laid out just like a star, David. Just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the middle. And uh, Balaam's response, uh, his prophecy... He spoke, he took up a parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? And how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. And the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned from among the nations. And who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number of the fourth part of Israel... Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. So he, he didn't bless him. I mean, he didn't curse him. He, he, he blessed them instead. And in verse 14, And Balak brought, unto him, brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah. Zophim means place of the watchers and it's basically he took him up to a high lookout and he told him to build seven altars there again and he said unto Balak stand there by thy burnt offering while I meet the Lord And he took up this parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. And his, his answer, he refers to the constellations of the Zodiac. The in verse 21, the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, which is the ox, and it, which is Taurus. And surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there divination against Israel. Which I think that's a reference to Gemini. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Uh, 
lost my note. But rot is a word that I believe is referring to cancer. He says, Behold, thy people shall rise up as a great lion, which would be Leo. Uh, and the significance of Balaam responding with a reference to the Zodiac, which even gets clearer in his next uh, prophecy, is really similar to Jesus replying or re rebuttal in Satan with the Word of God. Because if the Word of God is written in the stars, and which I believe it is, which is what this series is about, then, then it's uncanny. Then, then Balaam is answering Balak with the Word of God, just like Jesus is answering Satanas, the accuser, with the Word of God. And it... And he's tempted again a third time. And Balak brought Balaam to the top of Peor, which looketh towards Jeshimon. And, and, and he tempted Balaam again to curse the people of the Lord. Did, did Balaam sell out? Like, yes, Balaam sold out. It's hard to make out from the text. Jesus survived. He didn't give in to the temptation. But after Balaam's third prophecy and third temptation, he goes on. And gives a third prophecy. I mean, a fourth prophecy. Uh, and Jewish rabbis feel that he told Balak what Balak wanted to hear. Uh, and we'll look at this a little closer. Revelations 2.14, which is speaking to the seven churches. To the church in Pergamos, right? These things saith he which had the sharp sword with two edges, which is coming out of his mouth. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, which is the high place where Satan tempts you to cast down God and to lift yourself up for your own reward. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast... There them which hold the doc doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. It, it's hard to get that out of the text. Uh, it, it, it was a Jewish tradition that he's referring to. This is a Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 2, in the article on Balaam. It says, The rabbis hold Balaam responsible for the unchastity which led to the apostasy, uh, apostasy in Shittim, and in chastisement of which 24,000 persons fell victim to pestilence. When Balaam, the wicked, saw that he could not curse the children of Israel, God wouldn't allow him to curse the children of Israel. Like, even though he's like rushing to go with Balak to get that money, like God wouldn't allow him to curse Israel. And as a last resort to tempt the Hebrew nation to immoral acts through these to the worship of Baal Peor, the God of the Hebrews, adds Balaam, hates lewdness and, serve ch and severe chastisement must follow. So it's a rabbinical tradition that, that Balaam told Balak how to trick the Jews into their own demise, which the following chapter is an account. Uh, chapter 25, and is so as soon as Balaam rises up and goes to return to his place, and Balak goes on his way, they part ways. 
Israel abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, who Balak was the king of. He was the king of the Moabites. Uh, so they fell into idolatry and fornication, mixing with the Moabites. And so in Revelations, where it says that they followed the doctrine of Balaam and Balak, because Balaam taught, how would say it? Doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So they accredit this behavior that follows in Numbers chapter 25 with the interaction between Balak and Balaam. And I, I like comparing this real quick to Judas Iscariot. Because he wanted the money too. Luke 22, verse 3. And the chief priests, verse 2, And the chief priests sought how they might kill Jesus, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan, an accuser, the accuser, into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray unto them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him uh, in the absence of the multitude. So, they were going to do this in secret. So, they attribute in the New Testament uh, the devil entering you uh, with the temptation for money to have advantage over others. You're going to lift your... Jesus was all about equality. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Judas lifted himself up above Jesus for money to cast Jesus down. And that's essentially satanic possession. And I hope this helps people see how Jesus likened himself to a likening his crucifixion to a serpent on the pole typifies the redemption of corruption. From here, we're going to talk about how Jesus' own people called him a devil and how Jesus and the serpent both said ye shall be gods uh, two paths to the same goal uh, say these things out of equality amen